Okay, let's start with lesson one. And again, if you have anything specific, type in the chat box and I'll try to answer it. But just at the beginning, I want to make sure we understand the difference between an allele and the gene pool. So we're talking about population genetics. In other words, an entire population's genes. And an allele just means a particular form of a gene. So we all have thousands of genes in our, in our chromosomes. And even with each gene, there's more than one form that that gene can exist in. So for example, I, I have the eye color example here where there's an allele for dark eyes and there's an allele for light eyes. And so the allele would be whether you have the dark eyed form or two of the dark eyed forms or two of the light eyed forms or one of each. You can think of it too with, with hair. Is your hair curly or wavy or straight? And so you have an allele for that. Now, the gene pool, okay, would be for the entire population, this would be the collection of all the alleles. So in other words, if you have a population of, you know, 100,000 people, if you add up every um, allele for the brown or the dark-eyed color and every allele for the light-eyed color, that would make up the gene pool. And this equation is Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium equation, which I'm going to put up here, which is P squared plus 2PQ plus Q squared. This is the mathematical equation that's known as Hardy-Weinberg. But what's important for us to understand about that is what it's saying is if this equation is true, that means the gene pool for a population from one generation to the next to the next is not changing. There's not a change. So in other words, the number of alleles for dark eyes stays the same as the number, you know, from generation to generation. If a population is not in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, that means from one generation to the next, there's a change. So you have less dark eyed alleles versus light eyed alleles or vice versa. You have some kind of change from one generation to the next. Now, in reality, okay, a population staying in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is not the, not the norm. It's not common. Um, many times there are small changes in the allele frequencies or the gene pool of a population. Now, I want to make sure that we make this, con this connection, okay? So there's this term right here, microevolution. And all that that means is that there is a change in the gene pool from one generation to the next. That's all that that means. So you basically have two options, okay? A population can either be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium, so there's no changes in the gene pool, or a population can be having microevolution, which means there are changes in the gene pool. So it's one or the other. And what I want us to focus on for a little bit is what would be the conditions that would cause a population either to stay in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium or to shift um, out of Hardy-Weinberg? In other words, microevolution would be occurring. So let's, um, let's just go off of here for just a second and go to the whiteboard. Okay. Just a second. All right. So, whoops. Ah. Sorry. Let's just do this. Okay. Over here, we're saying a population is in Hardy Weinberg equilibrium. Over here, we have microevolution. Okay. So it's one or the other. And there are certain conditions that have to be true in order for a population to be in Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. And so there's no particular order, but let's say, first of all, there can be no mutations. Okay, a mutation is just a random change in the DNA, right? It's random. Now, what I want you to know about mutations, besides the fact that it's random, okay, mean sometimes, Okay, these mutations could be helpful. Sometimes they might be harmful. 
and sometimes they have no positive or negative effect. Okay, these are truly random. It's not like an organism is mutating in order to get to a certain goal. That's not how mutation happens. It's random. Now, many times we think of a mutation as being a helpful thing. Well, that's because when a mutation is harmful, the organism dies, right? So we don't see that. But for example, with um, antibiotic resistance in bacteria, that's due to a mutation that's occurred. But it doesn't mean the bacteria mutated to be able to survive an antibiotics. It's just that lots of mutations were occurring. However, the ones that are surviving are the ones that were able to live in the antibiotics. So no mutations can be happening. And, and it's easy to see that if you have a mutation, then that's going to be new genes, right? That's going to shift the gene pool. So over here on this side of microevolution, we say, all right, if there are any mutations happening, that's new changes in the DNA, that's a potentially new alleles, right? That can shift a population out of hardy lombard equilibrium. Okay, what else? What other features are we interested in? Well, here's an interesting one, okay? Random mating. So for a hardy mom, for a population to stay here in this equilibrium, for the most part, organisms are having to choose their mates randomly, not based on certain characteristics, which is not usually the way it works. So over here we say non-random mating. Okay, and let's think about the animal kingdom here. Let's let's look at another term that's on your review sheet. Sexual dimorphism, okay, this essentially means that the males and females look differently, right? So if you think about birds, most in most of the bird species, the male bird is the pretty one, right? They're the one that gets like the cardinal and the bluebird. They get the pretty coloration, the peacock. Um, the female is like this brown, drabby looking thing. But the reason is, is because it's the female that's selecting the mate. The female gets to decide who the mate's going to be. So she may select the male based on a certain song that he sings, based on, you know, the color of his feathers, based on the way he builds a nest, based on, you know, like the bird of paradise, certain little dance that they do. Um, so this is going to introduce microevolution, right, changes in the gene pool because there are certain traits which are because of genes or alleles that are being selected for. It's not a random process. All right, now let's talk about natural selection, which made up a lot of, of the chapter. Okay, whoops, no natural selection over here for hardy Lombard. And if there is natural selection, that can certainly cause microevolution or a shift of hardy weinberg equilibrium. So um, let's talk about a little bit about natural selection. First of all, Charles Darwin, right, is the one who coined this idea or came up with this thought about the same time as another scientist named Wallace, but we, we typically give Darwin the credit for that. There's a few things that we have to understand about natural selection. First of all, there already has to be variation present in the population. In other words, there are already different alleles, okay, that are there present in the population. There has to be more offspring than can survive. And but what I mean by that is there are limited resources. Okay, so there are more individuals born than that habitat can support, whether it's shelter or food or something. So there's competition for these resources. Okay, and so what that means is that there have to be some kind of characteristics that can be inherited, passed from one generation to the next, that give an advantage. Okay, they give an advantage in some way to some organisms over others. So one of the best examples I think to use is let's let's talk about giraffes. So if you imagine giraffes eat leaves off of trees. So if there's a drought and all the giraffes then eat the low hanging leaves 
and there's and the drought continues, then the giraffes with the shortest necks can't reach the remaining leaves. They starve, they die. If the drought continues, the giraffes with just medium length necks die. They starve, okay? What you're left with is the giraffes with the longest necks. Those are the only ones that live long enough then to pass on their genes, or they live longer so they pass on their genes at a greater frequency than the others who've already died. So when you look at the next generation, what does it look like? Well, the giraffes are going to have longer necks than the generation before because the only giraffes that survived were the long neck giraffes, and they're the only ones that passed on their genes. Um, now, obviously, this doesn't work if the characteristic isn't inheritable. In other words, if it's not something that you can inherit from your parents, then it's not natural selection. But I, I many times, um, it, the way we term this or what people say as well, survival of the fittest, okay, that's true to a certain degree. But just surviving doesn't change the next generation, right? It's really because the genes are being passed on to a greater degree. So it's the fittest person doesn't just mean they survive or fittest organism. It means that they pass on their gene, more genes. Okay, so that's, that's natural selection. And obviously, if you have that happening, you're going to have a change in the gene pool. So that's going to lead to microevolution. Now I'm going to have to give us some more space here. Right. So I'm going to put over here, this is our Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium side. This is where we have no change over here. This is our microevolution side. This is where we're having change. So we did mutation. We did non-random mating or no mutation. No, uh, We did random mating. We did natural selection. And now I want us to talk about something called genetic drift. So over here, no genetic drift, which means if there is any genetic drift, it's going to lead to microevolution. What is genetic drift? Here's the key word. When you think of genetic drift, you think chance. Okay. Natural selection is not chance, right? That's environmental pressure. So that's something that is allowing that organism to survive in that environment better than other organisms. Genetic drift has nothing to do with that purely by chance. Now, there's two types of genetic drift. So genetic drift is sort of the overarching thing. Then under that, we have the founder effect. We'll talk about in just a second. And then we have the bottleneck effect. Okay. The founder effect is when you have a small group that goes off and starts a new population, okay? And these, this group is small enough that it can't possibly represent the entire alleles of the population that they came from. So in other words, you're taking a small subset of the genes or the alleles, and you're starting a new population with only those. So you, you've started out with much, much less diversity. The bottleneck effect is when a population actually um, gets reduced drastically, and in that reduction, you lose a great number of alleles or genes. The difference is, this is not because of natural selection. This would be by chance. So uh, the best example I can give you for this is like a natural disaster, so like a hurricane, a tornado, something that it, it is not the characteristic of the animal that allowed it to survive or the organism. It's truly by chance. So if you think about, you know, frogs, around a pond. If a tornado comes through, and before the tornado you had 50% green frogs and 50% brown frogs. Well, the tornado wiped out, you know, 90% of the frog population. And it just so happens that the only surviving frogs are green. It's not the green color of the frog that allowed it to survive, right? It's just by chance that those are the ones that survived. But now we have a population with much less diversity only represents a small percentage of the alleles of the original population. So that's genetic drift. And let me see, I have. So 
So I have um, a, a rabbit example here to show you. Um, and so at the top, we see we have, you know, more brown rabbits that we have some white rabbits. If in the next generation, we only have brown rabbits that are able to reproduce. Okay, now we've reduced it. Well, this generation, if all we have are these two remaining so that they can reproduce, now we have only brown. So we have only a fraction of those represented. So this, this bottle with all the different colored marbles in it, it would represent all of the diversity in a population, in a large population. If only a few survive, okay, then a lot of these alleles or genes from the original population are not going to be present. So that, that genetic diversity is just lost. Now before we go back, so the next characteristic we're going to talk about that shifts a population out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium is called gene flow. So I'm going to show you that slide and then we'll go back. Gene flow is simply when you have an individual that goes from one population to the next. Okay, and so an example could be geographically. So we have these two isolated populations with different genes or different allele um, frequencies. And if one individual from this beetle group on the right crosses over to the other beetle group, now you've changed both populations, right? The green beetles have gained new alleles and potentially the brown beetles have lost some alleles because they've lost a member of their population. So if gene flow is occurring, that leads to microevolution or takes a population out of Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium. So let's go back. So we um, look through at the bottom here, we have our first, so this one, the five situations we just talked about, we'll put in the study guide. So this would be natural selection. This is the one that has to do with the, the characteristics or alleles that provide characteristics that allow some organisms to survive better than others, and they're the ones that pass on their genes. Okay. <clears throat> now, natural selection can occur in actually three different ways. Okay, so we can put here in these blanks, it can be directional selection. Directional. It can be stabilizing. And it can be disruptive. And let's look at what that looks like. So here's some examples of the three. So at the top here, in this example, we have uh, robins and the number of eggs they have in their clutch. And this, this, the stabilizing selection means, so we have this larger bell curve here, okay? Stabilizing would mean it moves it more towards the mean, right, or towards a medium middle value. And the reason in this case is that it, it, it stabilizes toward that is the, if the clutch gets too large, then there's so many chicks that there's not enough food, so you end up with, you know, unhealthy malnourished chicks. But in the smaller clutches, if there's only one or two, they may not survive. So there's, there's sort of a, a happy medium is how you might think about it in the stabilizing selection. Now in directional selection, so in the, one of the videos for this that week one, I talked about the, the peppered moth. And remember that basically you don't have a middle value to the, to the most to a great extent because you have moths that are blending into tree bark. So if you have light tree bark, the light colored moth is going to blend in and not be seen by the prey. Whereas when you have polluted or darker tree bark, it's the darker colored moth that dominates because it blends in. So you have sort of um, a shifting, right? Depending on the habitat in which these moths 
are living in. So at the beginning, before the Industrial Revolution, the majority of the moths were the lighter color because the bark was that color. After the Industrial Revolution, where there was all the pollution, you had to shift in this direction because the bark was darker. So the lighter colored moths were getting eaten right, by birds, and so you only had dark colored moths there to pass on their genes. Now diversifying selection is when you have both extremes that are present at the same time. So um, in an in a environment where maybe you have very dark colored soil with light colored rocks or light colored soil with dark colored rocks, so you have uh, two extreme colorations where animals can camouflage. So you have some that are camouflaged by the darker colored parts of the ecosystem and some that are camouflaged by the lighter color. So that's why you would have both extremes, but yet this middle phenotype, the sort of in-between, really sticks out no matter what. In the dark area and the light area, it gets, it's visible and, and then therefore gets acted on by prey. Again, if you just join, if you have any questions, put them in the chat box, and I'll be glad to make sure that I answer these as we go along. All right, number two, this one is mutation. So these are the key is they're random, right? And they may be beneficial, they may be harmful, or they may be neither. These are just random. Either way, it's leading a population out of hardy weinberg equilibrium. This is genetic drift that we just talked about, the founder effect. And um, if you watched the video um, for the week, uh, for this particular week, this I talk about with the founder effect, the Amish population in Pennsylvania and how you know there was a few people that came and started that population and for the most part they don't have a lot of new genes that come in and so they have a higher concentration of certain alleles because of that founder effect. Okay, let's see. It looks like somebody somebody has a question. Maybe. So, um, if you have a question, if you can type it in the chat box, that would be great. I want to make sure I answer everybody's questions. Okay, so now we move on to number four. That was the gene flow. Whoops. Um, let's fill in this blank bottleneck. A natural disaster severely reduces a population. And this would be gene flow. Okay, where you have individual moving in or out of a population and this is non-random mating so this is where animals or organisms are choosing to mate based on a particular characteristic so sexual selection you know that that's like we talked about based on their song if it's a bird or the nest that they build now there's another side to that we, that was sort of the one organism's choice. There's another side to that where the males will actually fight, right, for the ability to mate with the females. So think about you know, deer or elk or rams or um, horses, those kind of organisms. Sexual dimorphism is just referring to the fact that the males and females have different physical characteristics. So like the birds, the bluebird, the, the male is blue and the female is brown. Okay, we have two terms here that mean the development of a new species. And the difference that I want you to know about this uh, is that one of them occurs based on geographic separation and one it is not geographic. Okay, so allopatric, right? There's a geographic separation, and then over time, you've, you've created two separate species that no longer are the same, either based on their habitat or their food source, or something has caused microevolution to occur to the point where they're no longer exactly the same species. Sympatric it doesn't have specifically to do with a geographic change. 
So the, the book, uh, an example that, that your book talks about is some fish that live in a particular lake and that they essentially live in different layers or different depths of the lake, which has caused them to be separate species. So they don't interbreed any longer. They have different um, types of prey that they feed on. So they, they have developed a difference even without a geographic separation. Okay, homologous structures and analogous structures. Uh, homologous sort of means the same, right? So this would mean common or similar. The, the way that they describe these structures is they are hypothesizing that these have common descent. So they have similarity in, their, in the way that their structure has um, developed over time. And an example of this would be like the wing of a bird and the wing of a bat. Now, it's not just because they have flight. It's based on the bone structure, okay? So birds have feathers and hollow bones, and bats don't have feathers. They just have skin stretched across their bones. But the general bone structure of a bird and a bat are similar, and that makes them homologous. Now, if we talk about an analogous structure, okay, these may have the same purpose, for example, flight, but they have no common um, ancestry. So in other words, the way that they produce flight has no structural similarity. So for example, if we think about the, bird of a, the wing of a bird and the wing of a bee, a bee doesn't even have bones, right? This is an insect. A bird has bones and it has feathers. So the way that the, the wings are constructed are structurally completely different. However, they both do allow for flight. And this last term, maximum parsimony, and in, in, in trying to explain relationships of organisms, um, what they're saying is they are hypothesizing that the event occurred in the most obvious way or more straightforward way, um, more simplest way. It would be like if I told you, well, I'm going to drive to the grocery store. So I would take the paved road versus some off-road, you know, trip that would be unexpected. That's sort of what maximum parsimony means. And that takes care of study guide one. So let's move on to study guide two. And we'll go through, we may look at some figures as we go. Again, if you have questions, just let me know. So um, let's do, we talk some about viruses. And a couple key things. First of all, viruses are not living, right? We know that all living things have to be made of cells. And because viruses do, do not have a cell. They're smaller than that. We don't consider them living. They have certain things that are necessary, so they have to have some kind of nucleic acid, or that is their genetic material. DNA can be the nucleic acid, or RNA, either way. It can be double-stranded, or it can be single-stranded. So there are different types of viruses with all these different um, types of genetic material. They all, though, have some kind of this cover around them that's made of protein called a capsid. And then some viruses will have an envelope, but they're not required to. And this is something that many of you pointed out when you did the computer virus versus biological virus, that they are very specific to a host. Okay, so not a host organism and many times a particular host cell within a host organism. So they have a certain target and they can't live outside and replicate outside of the host. So viruses have been classified lots of different ways. Um, sometimes by the, the type of genetic material and how the it's replicated inside the cell. Also based on what kind of shape the virus is. Um, and I do want you to know the steps 
in a viral infection. So the first one is attachment. The virus has to attach to the host cell. And it may do that based on the envelope, based on um, some, some of the markers on the capsid, right? It may attach to a receptor on the host cell. There's lots of different ways, but it has to attach to the host cell in some way. And then the genetic material has to get in, okay? Somehow the DNA or the RNA has to enter into the host cell. Um, then we have replication of the viral genome and the host then machinery is used to assemble new virus, virus particles. And lastly, we have egress, which means the virus is getting out of the cell. Okay, to infect other cells. Now, this can occur, occur either by lysis, in other words, the cell is burst and it releases the virus particles, or okay, they may bud out of the cell, which does not harm the cell. Okay, depends on the virus. Now, a bacteriophage is a virus that specifically infects bacterial cells. So the bacterial cell is the host to this particular type of virus. Now, it can have two different ways um, that the infection goes, um, or two different parts of the infection cycle. The lysogenic cycle means that the viral genome, so the DNA or the RNA, right, of the virus, okay, um, is, has become inserted into the host genome, okay, or the host chromosome. So we're talking about the viral DNA or RNA, it gets inserted into the bacterial genome. And when, when that happens, it's called a prophage. And, and, and it's not harming the host cell at this point, right? The DNA or RNA is just there. Every time that host cell replicates, now when it divides, one divides into two, two to four, four to eight, every time it divides, it's also taking with it the viral DNA and replicating it. Every daughter cell is going to have that, that prophage, that viral DNA in it. At some point then, it can switch to what we call the lytic cycle. And in the lytic cycle, this is when the new virus, okay, are going to be released from the host cell, okay, and this is by lysis or bursting the cell. So at some point in the lysogenic cycle, the, the, it can be switched to the lytic cycle where then the, the virus particles are, they, they lyse the cell, they're released out, and they enter neighboring cells. Okay, moving right along. Now, lysogenic and lytic cycle, they, they for the most part refer to bacteriophages, viruses that infect bacterial cells. But animal cells, they also have, um, they don't, they're not always just disruptive. So we're called it the lysogenic cycle in the bacteriophage. We can call animal, Animal viruses can be called latent or they can be in latency. I don't know what happened there. And, and that's the same thing where they're sort of dormant, right? They're not bursting the cell. They're not actively harming the host at that particular stage. Now let's talk for just a second. Let me get that off of there. About animal viruses and the different ways that they can cause problems for us and other animals. So we can have acute disease. We can have a chronic infection, or we can have an infection where we have intermittent symptoms. So I want to talk about that and, and give some examples. So let's talk about an acute disease. Okay, we are in the height of a really bad flu season, okay, and there's also always colds this time of year. So a cold or the flu would be an example of an acute disease. So what is an acute disease? It's when you have 
a short, this, this infection lasts a short period, right? And the symptoms sort of get worse and worse and worse and worse until your immune system defeats it and then you're better. So it's a short period with pretty increasingly worse symptoms. So a cold and flu would be that. Now what about a chronic infection? Okay, chronic infection, chronic meaning this is a long-term in infection, okay? And, but we have a really low level whoops, of symptoms occurring. May not even be noticeable for, for many, many years. So as far as our human viruses go, hepatitis C is probably a really good example of that. And hepatitis C, the virus, what it attacks is the liver. So it may be for years doing low levels of damage to the liver where the person who's infected is unaware. And because of what's going on in the liver and the virus, it's an oncogenic virus, meaning it can cause cancer. So eventually it can lead to liver cancer if left untreated. Um, intermittent infection would be when it sort of comes and goes. Okay, um, so the best examples of this would be cold sores, right? Herpes simplex virus, okay, or the or the venereal disease. Either one, there. I mean, either one is the same way. You have the virus forever; you never get rid of it, but it comes and goes. Okay, it can it can go in latency where it doesn't do anything, and then it can cause lesions again. The other example of an intermittent virus that I want you to know about is chickenpox. So let's say that you got chickenpox as a child. So you had a period, right, where you had all the spots and it itch and everything. Well, then you got over the chickenpox. But the virus is still there living in your nervous tissue. It's not gone. And at some point, some people will actually have a recurrence of chickenpox because of the virus is there. But many times what happens is later in life, the same virus will cause shingles, okay? It's just a, a recurrence of that virus, and it presents itself a little bit different way, but it's the same, the same initial virus. So how do we deal with, with viruses? Vaccines is one method, and uh, what here? What's going to go in this blank right here? Antiviral drugs which are a fairly new thing for pharmaceuticals, okay? Vaccines are our best method for, for, for controlling viruses. Now let's talk about what is an attenuated vaccine? What are the benefits of a live and a dead vaccine? So an attenuated vaccine just means that it's, the virus has been weakened in some way. So it's not the potently infectious virus that it is naturally. So many times what they do is when they're growing up the virus for the vaccine, they grow it up in conditions that are different from what it would be inside of our body. Temperature is wrong. The host cell is wrong. Okay, so they, they cause the virus to adapt to this new condition. Therefore, when we go get the shot, the virus just doesn't grow very well in our body. And so it gives our immune system an opportunity to take over, you know, recognize it, get rid of it. And then when we actually see the true, so let's say flu, then our immune system is already ready to attack that flu virus. Now, um, obviously a dead vaccine is going to be safer because it has no way to become infectious. It's dead. Whereas a live vaccine does have a potential, right? So an attenuated vaccine is still live. It's just attenuated, right? It's, it's weakened. But the live vaccine is a much more effective vaccine. Now when I ask what is the danger of, of using a live vaccine, well remember the attenuated means that it's weakened. Um, it does have a potential to do what we call a back mutation. In other words, mutates back to its more virulent, more infectious form. And there was a case recently where that happened in Nigeria in about, it was 2007, when they were vaccinating for polio, and they actually had an epidemic of a polio outbreak because of this back mutation of this polio in, in the vaccine. Now, I want to make sure I'm clear, I'm not, I'm not telling you not to get your vaccines 
I've got all, I'm up to date on all mine. My kids get all their vaccines, so I'm not an anti-vaxxer, so I don't want to promote that. I'm just telling you the difference between live and dead vaccines. Now, flu shot, okay? It wasn't very good this year, right? It wasn't very good last year. Some years it's better than others. Um, why is it that I can't go get a flu shot this year and I never have to get one again? Well, that's because this particular virus has a very high mutation rate. So the flu, plus there's more than one strain of flu, but the flu that we see this year is different than the flu we saw last year. It'll be different than the flu we see next year. And so when they're designing the flu shot, they literally have to get together, these people who study the flu and diseases, and they decide which strain do we think we're going to see as the worst one this coming year. And they, it's, it's, it's an educated guess, right? But there's still guesswork involved. And so sometimes it just doesn't cooperate like they thought it would. All right, Tamiflu. Um, I know that there's a lot of it being prescribed right now. It is essentially making the virus um, weaker. It, it, it stops it from spreading to your cells as quickly. So hopefully if you get it early enough, it, it helps the flu not to be so bad. Okay, now these things right here, these are terrifying to me, prions. I'm somewhat of a germaphobe. And these, so it stands for proteinaceous infectious particles. And it seems like something out of a movie, but it's real. These are not cells. These are just proteins. However, what's scary about these proteins is the infectious proteins are the same amino acid sequence as their normal counterpart. They're just misshapen. So if you'll remember, if you've had 1408, the shape of a protein is, is important. It's very important, the three-dimensional shape. That's what, if it can't do its job if it's not in its normal three-dimensional shape. Well, these prion proteins are misshapen a little bit. But the problem is when they come into contact with a correctly folded protein, it causes the correctly folded ones to misfold. So it sets up a chain reaction. Okay, And what we see with infectious prion diseases is their target is the brain. And so you end up with basically holes in your brain tissue. So we're going to go on in a minute, but, but mad cow disease is a prion disease, okay? And this is the other scary part to me. Can you cook them or burn them or treat them with alcohol or do something to kill them? No. And some of the reports are that even preserved specimens of brains that have been sitting in the, the preserved, you know, preserved media for years still have infectious proteins present. Um, so let's talk about some examples of prion disease in animals and in humans. Okay, so I already mentioned mad cow, put it up here, okay, and the technical name is bovine spongiform whoops encephalopathy the okay, BSE, and this is what we would call mad cow di disease, and you know the symptoms, right? They they start to act mad. Okay, um, it has been known to be transmitted to humans, right? It happened. It's happened in Europe several times. Okay, and the the disease in humans is called Crutchfield Jacobs disease. Okay, same thing. It causes holes in the brain tissue. Okay, there's not a cure for this. Now there are other diseases in sheep. There is one called scrapie, and there is another human disease called kuru, which Back in about the 70s, there was an epidemic of this in a particular village. And what was happening, the, the people in this village practiced cannibalism of, of dead people. And by eating the brain tissue, right, they were just infecting themselves with this prion. So um, fun, fun things to talk about, right? Um, another example, 
So are all of these on the test? I want you, I want you to know generally what a prion disease is. Um, let me think. Be able to recognize BSC and Crutchfield-Jacobs. Um, I think that's probably good enough, those two main diseases. Okay, sure. Viroids, then, are other just little particles, okay? These aren't cells. It's essentially just pieces of RNA that become infectious. They're pathogenic. But these target plants, okay? Not us, just plants. Now let's move on to taxonomy. I'm going to try to speed it up a little bit. I don't want to keep you here all night. Um, taxonomy is just the, the science of naming and classifying living things. And if we start out and we say, all right, the biggest division, if we take everything living and we divide it the first time, then it would be into three domains. And so the three domains are eukarya, which are made of eukaryotic cells, RK, and bacteria. Okay. Now, these are the only, this is the only domain that, that has eukaryotic cells. RK and bacteria both have prokaryotic cells. Okay. What you how do you know the difference between the two? RK, these are extremophiles. Okay. They live in extreme heat, extreme cold, extreme salt. Um, extreme pHs, they live in all kinds of conditions that you would think something couldn't really live in that condition. That's, that's RK. Now let's look, and, and each of these domains then is going to be further divided right into smaller and smaller and smaller categories. I want us to look at <clears throat> um, the categories. So remember, if you use this sentence, King Philip came over from Great Spain and used the first letter from each of those words. That will help you order these. So King Philip came over. Whoops. Oops, sorry, we already have kingdom there. So after kingdom, King Philip came over from Great Spain. This is phylum, class, order family, genus, and finally, species. So domain, right, is the largest group that's the most inclusive. Then obviously species is going to be the least inclusive. And you saw when you went through your taxonomy lab that, th that the questions get more and more specific and narrow, right, as you move down in the, in the categories. Scientific names are always two-part names. Okay, it's called a binomial, and they're written in a certain way. So I ask you here, this Marmota Monax, how would you write that? Okay, well, you you capitalize the first letter, the first word. The second word, however, is not capitalized. And since I'm writing, handwriting it, I would underline both of them. Now, if you're typing it, you can italicize it. But if you're handwriting it, it would be underlined. So the first word, this is the genus, right? And then the second word is called the specific epithet is what it's called. Together, this is the scientific name for a species. All right, phylogenetics. Um, the goal of phylogenetics is to show relationship, specifically evolutionary relationships between organisms. So let's fill these in. Um, a phylogenetic tree is made up of clades and is called a cladogram or a cladogram. And a clade is going to include an organism and all the ancestors oops okay a shared ancestral character is found in all the members of the group whereas a 
shared, derived, my, my Wacom pen doesn't inter interact with this too well, so my writing is really not that bad, um, is found in only some members of the group. So we, we already talked a little bit about maximum parsimony, right? Everything occurs in the, the most obvious and simplest way. All right, we're moving right along. So keep typing your questions in if you have them. I'm going to go to lesson three, uh, study guide. And we're talking in lesson three about prokaryotes. So here's the thing, prokaryotes, I don't know that I, I talked about this yet. <laughs> yeah, sorry, you'll have to, he asked if I would do another one that you could read. No, I'm sorry, you'll have to <laughs> take my audio and make it work. Um, so let's talk about prokaryotes versus eukaryotes. And I have one, I know this was in the video, but I want us to talk about this really quick. So. Here's the big difference, right? The big difference is whether or not they have a nucleus. So over here, we've got nucleus. Over here, we don't have a nucleus. That's the biggest difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. But I also want you to know that these are larger, more complex, whereas these are smaller and simpler. Okay. Now, just to keep the term straight, bacteria, right? That is a domain. They belong over here. And RK is also a domain, and they belong over here. So both of these domains are prokaryotic cells. The prokaryote just means it doesn't have a nucleus. These happen to be organisms that have prokaryotic cells. Eukarya is the only domain made up of eukaryotic cells. All right, this is also important. All cells have to have DNA, all cells have to have ribosomes, all cells have to have cytoplasm, and all cells have to have a plasma membrane, which is not the same thing as a cell wall, right? Plasma membrane is the same thing as a cell membrane, okay? Those are just two terms that are used to mean the same thing. That's just the barrier, right, between what's in the cell and what's out. Okay, so let's fill this in now. Um, difference between eukaryotes and prokaryotes is that uh, prokaryotes do not have a nucleus. Okay, prokaryotes do have DNA though, right? We just said all cells have DNA or genetic material. Um, so where is it at? Well, there's no nucleus, so it's just free in the cell. Okay, also, Prokaryotes, they have a circular chromosome. We have linear chromosomes, right? We know they look like X's, but prokaryotes have a circular chromosome. Okay, so let's see if we can name these. All cells have DNA. We just looked at that. All cells have cytoplasm. That's the soup in the cell. All cells have a plasma or cell membrane. I'm going to do it like that. And all cells have ribosomes. In it, <clears throat> I want you to know the basic structure of a prokaryotic cell, which is much easier, right, than the eukaryotic cell we're going to get to eventually. So what does that mean if I tell you I want you to know the basic parts? Okay, <clears throat> I want you to know that the DNA, which is a circular chromosome, remember it's not a nucleus, It's called they call it a nucleoid. That just means that's where the DNA is. There's no membrane around it. It's just the DNA that's in the cell. The cytoplasm is all the soup, right? Then there is a plasma membrane represented with the green layer. All prokaryotic cells have a cell wall, okay? Not the same as a plasma membrane. They have a cell wall. And bacterial cells have something in their cell wall called peptidoglycan, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. What else? Some can have a flagella, 
for movement. They don't all have to have it. These little round things are the ribosomes. What, are, what do I need to know about that? Well, they need those because that's what makes the protein for the cell. And then these pili, okay, they can be used for attachment to surfaces or attachment to other bacterial cells, and they can actually, as we'll see in a little bit, transfer genetic material um, across the pili. All right, so we already mentioned that RK are files, and so there's all the different conditions in which they live. You need to know the basic morphologies or shapes. Okay, so coccus, these are the spheres, right? They're just little circles, and they can grow in chains. They can grow in clusters. Bacillus, these look like rods, okay? Whereas spirillum, right, these are the corkscrews. So I mentioned to you the cell wall of bacteria <clears throat> all have peptidoglycan, but it's it's where the peptidoglycan is located that differs between two um, classes of bacteria. And there's a special staining procedure that takes advantage of that, and it was invented by a man named Hans Christian Graham. Okay, let me answer a question super quick. Let me see what this question is. Um, you know the functions of the structures. So, like the flagella, yeah, know that it's for movement, and the pili for attachment and to transfer DNA. Um, and, and that's about it. The, that, that's about it on, on the structures that you need to know. Okay, on the staining procedure that Hans, sure, that Hans Christian Graham invented, there are either gram positive or gram negative bacteria. Gram positive are going to stain a, a purple violet color, whereas gram negative stain red pink. Okay, and they both have peptidoglycan, okay, but we're looking at the outer layer. And in gram-positive bacteria, they have this really thick layer of peptidoglycan on the outside, whereas gram-negative, they have a thin layer of peptidoglycan. And then outside of that, they have a different layer. It's called lipopolysaccharide, and you don't need to know that. You just need to know that there's a little bit difference in the chemically in the, where that peptidoglycan is. So it just causes, there's two different stains. There's a purple stain and a pink stain. The gram-positive ones accept the purple, and that's what you see. The gram-negatives accept the pink, and that's what you see. I also want you to know that the ones that are susceptible to uh, the antibiotic penicillin are gram-positives. And the way that the penicillin works, it attacks the cell wall, so it punches holes, or it prevents the cell wall from, from completing, and therefore the organisms die. Um, there's a letter missing here. They reproduce by binary fission, so it's it's not sexual reproduction, right? It's one cell divides into two, um, which means there would be no genetic diversity, right? It, just a, an exact copy. However, prokaryotes can get new DNA in a few ways. All three ways together collectively are called horizontal gene transfer, and the three ways are transduction, Transformation and conjugation. Okay, transduction is when a virus, like a bacteriophage, actually carries a piece of genetic material from one bacterial cell to the next. Transformation is when the bacterial cell Actually, there's DNA in the environment in which it's growing, and it takes the DNA up through its cell wall and plasma membrane. And conjugation is when two bacterial cells actually make a connection through the pili, sometimes it's called sex pili, and there's actually a transfer of DNA. So maybe, you know, an antibiotic resistance gene is transferred, and so now this new cell gains the ability to survive in the presence of antibiotics. All right, let's talk really quickly about metabolism. 
So what bacteria utilize and feed on, what they do. First of all, they participate in the carbon cycle, right? Some are helping to break down carbon-containing organisms, producing CO2. Some are taking the CO2 and converting it into um, chemical energy, so they participate in the carbon cycle. Nitrogen fixation is really important because even though nitrogen, the majority of our atmosphere, that we, the air is nitrogen, it's not in a usable form. So it's usually limiting for plants, but they can't use nitrogen gas in the atmosphere. So we rely on bacteria that turn nitrogen gas into a usable form, like nitrate or ammonia, something that plants can use. Okay, um, Rhizobium. These are organisms that have, they have this symbiotic relationship with plant roots, specifically legumes, so like peas and beans. And so they provide this, these usable forms of nitrate to the plant, and the plant produces chemical energy through photosynthesis that it can share with the bacteria. Um, so... I want you to know um, specifically it's legumes, right? Like beans, let me put it here. Beans and peas. Also, alpha hay, okay, has this relationship. Now, cyanobacteria, these are interesting. They are bacteria, however, they can photosynthesize. So they can use sunlight and convert it into sugar or chemical energy, okay? Now let's talk about our digestive health, all right? We have lots of good bacteria that are, we, already, we know they're on our skin, right? But we also have really good bacteria that colonize our digestive tract. And part of the job that they do is to prevent bad bacteria from coming in and colonizing and causing us harm, okay? This first one here, Clostridium difficile, or you may have heard of it as C. diff, this is, an, this is a pathogenic bacteria that can get into our digestive tract and cause us a lot, of, a lot of issues. Lactobacillus is a good, healthy bacterium. Um, so if you look on, if you buy yogurt or something else, a probiotic, this will be one of the organisms that, that they're putting in there, right? This is a healthy part of our normal flora. All right, let's talk about biofilms. Biofilms can be great and they can be terrible. So this is where the organisms are actually growing together in sort of this jelly-like substance. So dental plaque, right, that you get on your teeth, that's a biofilm, so that's bad, we don't like that. However, these biofilms can be used, for example, in a, in a wastewater treatment plant to start breaking down some of the waste in, in our sewage, um, in uh, remediation, like oil spill, things like that, biofilms can be helpful. However, this is a cause for a lot of the hospital-acquired infections because equipment, um, the normal sanitation procedures, it's hard to kill these biofilms once that they're established. So that's sort of the good and bad. Um, of biofilms. All right, let's talk about disease. Again, this, this is one of my favorite things since I'm such a germaphobe. Okay, endemic, pandemic, and epidemic. So right now, we would say, because it's flu season, that we have an epidemic of flu in this country. What does that mean? Okay, well, epidemic means essentially that you have a somewhat localized, and that's all relative, right? Oops. Outbreak. Okay. So, for a great example, we usually have an epidemic of flu, right, each year. Now, there have been times throughout history where it's been larger than an epidemic. So, we'll move down here and we'll say, all right, what about a pandemic? What does that mean? Okay, that's worse than an epidemic. So, you would say a pandemic is when it is. Um, worldwide and we're, we're talking specifically right about infectious diseases okay so like cancer 
cancer is not an epidemic or a pandemic because it's not a, a, an infectious disease. You don't pass it. It's not contagious. Um, so pandemic is when this outbreak would, would reach a worldwide proportion. So um, in history, there have been some times when the flu has reached that. Um, and if you're a history person, then you might remember or know that you studied about the Spanish flu of 1918, which killed millions and millions of people. Um, we have had other pandemics throughout history. The one that I mentioned to you um, is the bubonic plague, which sort of came, you know, around Europe, uh, around the world several times. Um, tuberculosis has been a pandemic at times. And you might could say that AIDS, is, that we're in a pandemic with AIDS at this point. Now, what does it mean to be endemic? Okay, this is sort of like, a constant low level. So an example of that would be parts of Africa where there's always a certain amount of malaria present, right? You, you don't get these huge outbreaks, but you just always have this low level around. All right, bubonic plague, what causes this? All right, this is caused by a bacteria. I'm going to try to write it where you can read it. If not, you have to look in the notes. It's Yersinia pestis okay and that's the cause of bubonic plague we have antibiotics today that help if someone gets the plague and not long ago in Arizona and New Mexico we had both people and rats that tested positive for plague so it's still around but we know we can treat it now all right foodborne illness okay there was an outbreak not too long ago um, on the news in uh, romaine lettuce, right? They don't eat your romaine lettuce. What types of food can carry foodborne illness? All. There's not a type of food that can't. So meat, vegetables, fruit, all of it is has the potential to carry foodborne disease. All right. Last study guide. I, I tell you what though, I just want to show you a couple things. All right, I have a question. Is it safe to say that we understand the material whoops, on the study guide? We are okay for the exam. Or do we need to be doing the outlines in order to do well on the exams? Okay. My goal in the study guides is, yes, to, to prepare you for the exams. Now, I don't want you to think just because you could fill in the blanks, like you have to, you know, know the topic generally that we talked about. So, it, for example, on the first one when we talked about natural selection and genetic drift and gene flow, not just know the definition of those, but be able to understand examples and how that works. But yes, um, I, I, my goal is not to try to put anything on the test that I'm not pointing out to you as important. So this would be my focus. I would, I would say, you know, look, read the chapters. Watch the videos, do your study guides, and I think that you should be prepared for the test with that. Okay, so, sure, absolutely. Um, and it looks like somebody raised their hand. If, if you will type in the chat box, I will make sure and answer your question. The chat box is that little speech bubble at the bottom left. If you'll type it in, I'll make sure and get to your question. All right. Last one. Lesson four study guide. Okay. Protus, this is probably the, the most difficult because it's maybe something that you had no familiarity with at all until you started this lesson. I mean, maybe you did. Um, and these are harder to keep straight because this last lesson we looked at, those were bacteria, right? We have some exposure to bacteria. We know that they make us sick, and we also know they're in probiotics. We know they're single-celled, prokaryotic organisms, tiny, microscopic. Protists, okay, are eukaryotic. They have a nucleus. So they belong in the same domain as us and plants and fungi, okay? So domain eukarya has four kingdoms, okay? Animals, that's us. Plants, fungi, and lastly, protists. 
All of these have nucleus, all nuclei. All of these are eukaryotic celled organisms. Here's the deal with protus. If it's not an animal, and it's not a plant, and it's not a fungus, and it has a nucleus, it gets put in this category, which means there's a lot of diversity, okay, with protus. Um, there are many that are single-celled microscopic organisms, but there are some that are multicellular. So the way that I want you to look at protus, even though, of course, in biology there's exceptions to all rules, right? But I, I, I want you to look at these in these general categories. For this class, I think this is plenty. All right, first of all, we're going to say we have three basic groups of protus. We have plant-like protus, we have animal-like protus, and we have fungi-like protus. Now, they're not plants, they're not animals, they're not fungi. If they were, they would go in those kingdoms. But based on their characteristics, we're associating them with those types of organisms. So why would I say plant-like? Well, they, they have the ability to do photosynthesis. So they are photo, meaning light, auto, meaning self, right, troph. So they can make their own food with sunlight, just like a plant can. And they, they don't get enough credit. Um, we many times recognize because they cause a lot of disease, not the plant likes, but other protists. But look, they make up the phytoplankton in the ocean. So the plankton that is photosynthetic, these are protists. They make up over 50% of the oxygen is pro are produced by these. So we give plants all the credit for that. Well, hey, there's a lot more algae in the ocean, right, that's doing a lot of that. So algae are what I'm referring to as the plant-like protist. So now you know an algae is not a plant, right? It's not a bacteria. It's a protist. Some algae are single-celled, but some are multicellular. So kelp would be a type. Right, that's multicellular. Something called diatoms are single-celled, and what's important to know about these, they have a cell wall made of silica, which is like glass. Okay, They're beautiful organisms. The, the leftover cell walls of these are essentially what is, if you go to the store and you buy diatomaceous earth for your garden or for your pool filter, it's the leftover skeletons, right, the cell walls of these diatoms. And industrially, they're used in reflective paint, um, in, in abrasive cleansers. Okay, we use them for a lot of things. And, and I've got to show you, because if some of you haven't seen them, they really are beautiful. And I want you to be able to recognize them. So here we go. Okay, so on the left... These look like beads or something you'd buy at the hobby store, but they're not. These are the these actual diatom diatom organisms. Okay, these are part of phytoplankton. And while I have this up on the right, the dinoflagellates, these are also algae. These are photosynthetic organisms, part of the plankton. However, they can can have an overbloom, right, and cause what we call red tide, like you see in this picture, which can be harmful to uh, fish and other marine life. All right, so we'll fill in here red tide, dinoflagellates cause red tide. So these are the plant-like protists, and I call them plant-like because they photosynthesize. Now we're going to move on to the animal-like protists. They have their own special name. So they're protists, but within the protist kingdom, these animal-like ones are called protozoans. Okay, when you think of protozoans, you can think this. They are pathogenic, okay, a lot of them. They cause more disease than any other group of organisms. Why do I say animal-like? Well, for one thing, they're heterotrophic, meaning they have, to, they have to ingest their food. They don't make their own food. And we're going to look at them. There's four protozoans, that I want, or four types of protozoans. And we're, we're looking at the different types based on how they move, their motility. So the first, and the, we draw, right, we've done it yet. the paramecium, which is mentioned here, is one of the organisms that you're going to view. And it's a ciliate, which means it has these tiny little hair structures all around it called cilia. And the cilia then allow it to move by beating the little cilia all at the same time. 
Now the next group are called amoebas, and these move by something called pseudopodia. And, and if you've ever seen those old movies, horror movies about the blob, okay, that's what these remind me of. So they, they have these extensions. They sort of look like a blob. Each of these extensions is called a pseudopod. But what happens is it sort of will ooze this pseudopod out, right? And then it'll come back in, and it'll ooze this one out and in. And that's how, number one, that's how it moves. And number two, that's how it can sort of surround prey, right? and take it in, just phagocytize it in. It's called phagocytosis when it takes in the prey. All right, um, then our next category, oh, whoops, that's still continuing on. So this is still, this is under amoebas. So I have here, I'm sure that you have heard of dysentery or amoebic dysentery which is no fun, it causes severe diarrhea, okay? It's caused by an amoeba called Entamoeba histolytica. Sporozoans actually don't have movement, instead they form spores. And the one I want you to know is Plasmodium vivax, it causes malaria. So we think of malaria being caused by mosquitoes, but it, mosquitoes aren't the cause. They're just, the, they're just a vector that carries this protozoan, okay? And then the last group of protozoans are the flagellates, and so you can probably guess they move with flagella, okay? And the one that I want you to know, the group is, they're called trypanosomes. And um, African sleeping sickness is caused by this just that this trypanosome, it also has a vector or a carrier called the tsetse fly. Okay, so it's not the fly that's making, that's causing the disease. The fly is just the carrier of this protozoan. Now our last category of protists are the fungi-like. So they, they look like fungi, however, their cell wall is made up of chemically of different organisms and they're cycle is a little bit different. So the one I want us to look at in just a second, I'm going to show you a picture, is called the slime mold. And what you should know about the slime mold, it has more than one life form, but of great interest is the plasmodial life form, is one very large cell where many, many cells have fused together, so you have these all these fused nuclei in this one very large cell. And you may have seen this growing out in your yard, um, I, I see it commonly after we've had a lot of rain in my yard. So here's an example of a slime mold. Okay, now that I believe is the end of the study guides. I, there's one other there's a couple that I realized that I didn't show to you. So the first one, if I want us to back up when we were talking about the gram stain with bacteria, and I said there's gram positive and gram negative bacteria, and the staining procedure was invented by a man named Hans Christian Gram. This is him, okay? And and you can see there's, I want to show you this because there's essentially, there's obviously there's gram positive, the purple are the gram positive bacteria, and the pinkish red are the gram-negative bacteria, so this is the difference in the staining procedure. But I, what I also want you to see is the purple, these are coccus, right, round spherical bacteria, whereas the pink or the red, these are bacillus or the rod-shaped bacteria. So we have gram-positive coccus and gram-negative bacillus represented in this particular figure. Now, I'm going to open it up for questions, and you let me know. I will, I will show you quickly a few more. So this is the paramecium. This is part of what you'll look at in your lab this week. And if you look really closely, you can see around the edge all of the little cilia on the outside of the paramecium.
these are the flagellates. So the round, these round things are red blood cells, right? These are human red blood cells. These guys are the protist or the protozoan. And this is the little little tail, the flagellated tail in which they move by. So this is this is the organism that causes African sleeping sickness that is carried by the tsetse fly. Here's my amoeba, okay? And so now you can see the, these are nucleated, right? These are eukaryotic cells, these protists. Here's the nucleus. You can see it stains darker in the middle of the cell. So this is the pseudopod, right, that moves out and then it'll come back in and this one will move out, okay? It can, they can surround, come together to surround a prey right here and take it in. Um, and I, I believe that that is what I have. Okay, here's, again, these are, these are red blood cells. These right here, they've been stained a little bit. This and this are the sporozoan plasmodium vivax. This is what causes malaria. 